So good afternoon, everyone. The first uh, Saturday that we meet for spring, right? Isn't that exciting? 74 degrees outside. I say this because it's nice to mark the dates that we will be talking and, and we're here meeting um, and giving continuation to this amazing work that is this book, the book Plenitude by Joanna DeAngelis. Uh, we have a copy here by Editora Leal. Uh, the book was uh, first published in 1991 in Brazil, and then it was later translated uh, into English, obviously. And uh, here we are today discussing uh, chapters uh, four and five. As Alba was saying, the book as is, you know, for some may say, it's deceiving, right? But the fact of the matter is that how can we reach plenitude if we don't know what's holding us back? And this is what we're studying. I like to remind everyone um, of that, that when we, before we get to a, a point, we have to prepare ourselves to get to that point, right? We have to um, gather ourselves. We have to change our garment, we, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. We have to um, understand our, the, the, our, our starting point, what we will see, perhaps, because we, can, we, we were not able to foresee anything, but to, f to understand what we may come in contact with it, as well as to try to grasp it. As abstract it may seem or may feel, try to grasp it what we are uh, trying to attain, right? So we have to have what? A plan. Keep these with you because I'm saying this is not just because I want to say it because it's within the, the lesson as well. The second thing that I like to say tonight, as I mentioned at the beginning and now at the end of every session, is that we must do what? We must read for ourselves. Get the book, read it, get your own conclusions, Correct if I'm saying anything wrong, because <laughs> I also need help. This is by far the, the, the person who is learning the most, I think, and needs to practice more and more of this is myself. Um, and and we, can, we can attest to this when we read a book and we present something. Even when we, if we share with colleagues, family members, whatever. We know that when we read who is, is benefiting the most, not the audience, it's myself. And if you guys do the same, you guys will be benefiting as well. So we have seen quite so far, um, quite a bit so far. Uh, we start with the, the introduction, pl plenitude. We talk about suffering in general, right? We analyzed, um, um, we did an analysis of suffering and we also studied the origins of suffering. So what did we see in chapter two and three since we covered the last two, two chapters um, um, a month ago. Do, does anyone have remembered, does anyone want to take, want to take a shot, what we saw, what we came across? <laughs> it's a month ago, Leo, leave me alone. <laughs> Remember that on um, chapter four, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter two, Joanna D'Angelo talk, talked about the noble truth by Buddha, right? Suffering, um, its origins, the end of suffering, and the path to liberation from suffering. And it's exactly what we're studying. So she is taking, she's bringing to us some um, um, Buddhist ideas or ideals um, and merging together with Christianity as well as bringing enlightenment of spiritism for us to get out of it, come out of it completely, understand it and really get out of it. And then th there is something very interesting that she talks about, suffering, um, appears in three different forms. Please give me at least one. Suffering from suffering, suffering from impermanence, and suffering resulting from conditioning. I know I don't have an example to give you that, um, a personal example to give you about suffering from conditioning, suffering from impermanence, thank God, um, which I still have, but nothing that comes to mind right now, I would like to share with you a suffering from suffering that I went through last month, right? And this was right after um, the, 
the, the presentation, I got sick. I got a cold. I had a cold. And this cold was obvious that I actually contracted by a colleague of mine that was told to go home. <laughs> go home. Don't stay. Don't stay. Everybody's going to get contaminated. Guess what? I got contaminated and I, I got sick. As we all know what happens when we get sick, right? Coughing, all those things. You can't focus. And, and it, it, was, it was pretty dramatic, right? And, and that is the cold in itself. I mean, it's hard to bear. It's suffering. But guess what? I had to take a step deeper into the suffering. <laughs> there was one morning that I got up, which was actually the morning that I, that I didn't go to work because I was very sick, that I sat down to read something from school. And here I am, couldn't concentrate. Headache, you know, nose, and you can imagine. And I started battling with the idea, why did this person stay at work? Why did this person did not leave? And here I am now miserable having to do and carry on with my you know, responsibilities, but I can't focus. And I start going to this process of battling with you know, the cold, the person, and my suffering. And I was like, wait a minute. And it, as if it was, as, as um, Devaldo Franco mentions, that when Joanna D'Angelo appears to him, when he's being kind of you know, um, irresponsible to say the least, um, she comes smiling, right? And that smile saying, look, just let it go. <laughs> let it go and do what you have to do. It's going to, everything shall come to pass. But just to kind of illustrate what we do sometimes with something that is suffering, right? I mean, the physical body, as we notice, is, is tough. It's not easy. And we all go through this, but we make it harder. And we battle with someone else. And we do all kinds of things that is not necessary at the time. So, an example, and you can take your own examples and you can go back and read again and really apply this in your life. Not that the impermanence part is not there, because I know I have to uh, work a whole lot on that, as well as the, the other part that comes from the, the old and bad behaviors that we have as well. So, we have to work on that as well. But moving on. That's what we, that's, this is what we're going to be working on it today. The end of suffering, and we will be talking about the approaches to end suffering. It's interesting that Joanna De Angelis says, okay, he's the end of suffering. This is how it's going to happen, and we're going to see this, right? And then she gives the approaches to get there, right? Some of you may be doing this. I wasn't. Just to, as a disclaimer, it, to me, is, this is a new concept altogether. Um, but let's try to find out what is this end of suffering means. What is she trying to, to say? <coughs> Excuse me. She starts the chapter by saying the following. Since suffering is a, it's kind of small. I don't know what's happening to this um, projector today. But I'll read for you. Just bear with me if you can, if you have any um uh, let me know if you have any difficult reading along with me. Since suffering is a sickness, there are se several effective ways to cure it. Some attenu attenuate it, others are harmless, but very few are undisputably effective. A real cure, however, can only occur if the therapy uproots its causes. As long as its generating sources are not extinguished, suffering inevitably manifests. Because the misuse of reason is what causes it, it is essential to get to the heart of its trigger so as to stop the energy that activates and viralizes. So, let's pause over here and think a little bit. If you have a headache, what do you do? Take Tylenol. Well, the headache will go away. Go away. Hmm? Okay, not right away, maybe. But it will, okay. Is the headache the root cause of the problem? Okay, so headache just went away. I'm feeling fine. Headache comes back tomorrow. What do you do? You take Tylenol again, Juliana? Okay. All right, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a plausible answer, okay. What else? What do you do? Okay, you Google. Fine. All right, so, so 
you, you take Tylenol, the headache goes away, you Google and Google says, okay, uh, there could be several things. So then you, um, you, 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 you stop and you kind of think about it a little bit and then you know, um, everything's fine. Um, you go to work, you do whatever you have to do. And then two days later, headache comes back again. What do you do? Go to the doctor, okay? So what would the doctor do? Huh? Lab tests, right? Extensive, hopefully, lab tests that they're going to ask you, you know, when this comes, what, what is causing it. Could we have done some of that work home by ourselves? Well, not the lab test. I'm talking about what the, what the doctor may ask you, the assessment of what perhaps is causing the headache, right? Do we do it? No. <laughs> Most often not, <laughs> right? Most often we just take the Advil, right? Take the painkiller. Does everybody agree? Right? This is our situation today. And this is what Joanna Jangel is trying to get to us, is that we have to get to the root causes. We have to uproot that problem. Okay, the headache is just a symptom. It's not the cause of my headache. It's not the cause of my problem. If you have a backache, the same thing. If you have this, you, you have the, if you are, there are, there are, there are many countless things that could be generating a suffering in our lives, whether it's physical, whether it is the torments of life, we have to get to that. And that is the hardest part because we are living in a materialistic world. We are materialistic. We live in, in we're in, emerged in matter right now. We want a quick fix. To a certain degree, this is great. Because I think this is what's going to take us to a level where um, we will start thinking faster in the future to this, um, this root cause. But most importantly, what she says here is that um, the, the reason, the part that she talks about the reasoning, and I lost myself here. And it's caused as long as it's pretty tracing, can occur. Because, me, the, because the misuse of reason is what, what causes it, it is essential to get to the heart of it what tri triggers, right? So we misuse our reason before, or sometimes we didn't use at all, <laughs> right? And then we find ourselves in troubles and situations that it's not, we're, they were not well guided. And that's what we are facing right now, the consequences of those, the, the misuse of reason. So we are being called to use our reason. Yes, we have to add the heart element on everything that we do as well, but we have to think about it twice before we, make, we, we do anything, before we say something, right? And this is what she's also bringing to us. So remember these key elements that we have to get to the root cause, we have to use our reason. I stumble upon something really interesting it's called, What is Enlightenment? It's a um, essay by Immanuel Kant, okay? And just an excerpt of this essay, he says the following. Enlightenment, and this is what he's trying to get to, to uh, uh, and, um, help us understand what enlightenment is. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed knowledge. Knowledge is the inability to use one's own understanding without another's guidance. This knowledge is self-imposed if its causes lies not in the lack of understanding, but in the indecision and the lack of courage to one's own mind, excuse me, to use one, excuse me, thank you, one's own mind without another's guidance. Dare to know, sapere ad, I guess this is in Latin, have the courage to use your own understanding is therefore the motto of the Enlightenment. It's, it, I can send it to you. I mean, you can Google the, um, what is enlightenment and you come across. It's amazing. It's a short essay, two pages. Read it. You will see that it's an amazing calling for all of us to use reason. Truly use reason. Find for yourself. Don't let Leo tell you that Joanna the Angel is saying A, B, C, but find for yourself. The same thing with any author. Question Kardec. Kardec ask us to do that, right? Really question what you're reading, what you're coming across. Question the headache. Question the, the, the products of life that everybody insists on saying, oh, it's okay. It's just fashion. It's just what's happening in the world, right? So you should do the same thing. It's okay if you're 
this way or that way. No question. For yourself. Just something. Because also our motto here, the, the SSB is what? Enlightening lives together. So I found it interesting that we were to bring this um, for ourselves. Here's something that I didn't want to show the whole thing at once because I want to <laughs> work together with you. But what is Joanna is, is trying to bring to us um, in, this, um, in this chapter also, I'll take one back that I, I wanted to go ahead and, 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 and connect with you is the following. Um, how we are responsible for one another, especially the more inferior kingdoms of life, right? Have a, who's any, who has a pet at home? Pets, pets, pets. Okay, good. Plants. Okay, right? So at least we, we somehow we connect with nature, right? The inferior, um, the lower levels. I don't want to say inferior. Thank you. The lower levels of life, right? The plants on how we take care. What do we do? Do they go through suffering? They suffer. They feel as well, right? But what do we do? We attain a weight, right? If you see the plant going the, some way that, you know, it's not going well, what do you do? You spray something, you clean it, you do whatever you, you, you know, put some whatever water, fertilizer and all, right? A little animal, what do you do? Feed him. First, for, first water, whatever, what else? Clean the little box, okay, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take to another level. What about our physical bodies? The little cells, the tissues, the organs, how do we treat them? The little animals, <coughs> they're inferior, right? It's not inferior, the lower level. Thank you, Yasuka, I keep saying the inferior, we're stuck with that word, but they're in the lower level. What do we do with them? Do we water them? We hope so, right? Do we feed them? <laughs> Do we change the little box? We, we better do that, right? <laughs> it, it's just for us to, again, remember these things when we're going through suffering so we can rationalize on it and then go get out of it. But what about our thoughts? What about our feelings? Is it in accordance to this well-treated um, um, life in general? Most of the time it's not, it's okay. It's okay. and, this is, and this is the power of us coming together tonight be, for us to realize this. So Joanna DeAngelis tells us, analyze how we take care of the, 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 lower, um, um, uh, the lower life in general in the universe. And we're going to see a little bit more about nature later on, but it's in, in, different, in a different way. You know, giving them, bring, giving more value to nature. But here's analysis of how we are responsible first and foremost, and how we have to help them grow. And the way we treat it sometimes, it's not in accordance to what we pray, right? Not in accordance to what, on how we want to conduct, um, conduct our lives. So moving on, in order to end suffering, it is essential to acquire a responsible attitude capable of going back to the origins of, the su of suffering, analyzing them and working them out with planned, purposeful direction. Educations, educating one's thoughts, discipling, disciplining, excuse me, one's habits and being sure of one's goal are a skillful means for ending suffering. Otherwise, therapies and techniques become mere pal um, palliatives. If there are, if there, are, there, there is one part of this chapter that I would like to bring emphasis to, and I should have made this a little bit bigger, is this part right here. These three things. Educating our thoughts, disciplining our habits, and being sure that our goals are skillful means for ending suffering. I'll repeat again. Educating our thoughts. How do we educate our thoughts? Can you stop it? No. We know that, right? If substitute, thank you. And Joanna Dion says this not only in this book, but she says in different books as well. Substitute. Something negative comes to mind. What do you do? Switch. But I challenge you to do one more thing. Ask yourself why that negative thought came to mind. I do that all the time. 
because let me tell you something, I have a lot of them. <laughs> Good, attraction. But what are you attracting to? What were you thinking about? Was it a, a, a reactive mode? Most of the time it is. And this is nothing, has nothing to do with this. This is an analysis that we're doing in this part over here. But was a reactive uh, thought, right, of fear based on, on anger, based on this or that, whatever. Or was a proactive thought that it, you just thought about, right? Is there any connection with someone else? A living being in the physical body or perhaps the other side? We have to acknowledge this as well. Educating the thought. Ask yourself, why am I thinking this way? Why am I reacting this way? Or I'm, why am I acting this way? Is it something from this life? Is it something from the past life? There are many ways that we can educate. And this is not, this is, I think this is, in a way, is, is abstract um, uh, for all of us to go into it. That perhaps we can schedule another session just for this, um, this three elements over here. But we need to do so. Disciplining one ha uh, our habits. How do we discipline our habits? Changing them. First, the thought, right? And then you give a kickstart. Give yourself one day, okay, I'm going to start this this day. And then take notes. Did it go well? Did I do it? No, I didn't do it. So what stopped me from doing? Um, what is preventing me from doing again if I did that day and perhaps the next day I didn't go? You know, let's say, you know, going to the gym or something. Or now that the, the weather is doing, is doing well, um, doing activity outside, right? And it's nice to, the reason I say this as well, is not just because of the weather or anything like that, because getting our physical body to go helps in many ways, and perhaps it can serve you as well if you want to take on a new endeavor that does, will not take the physical body. At least, I guess, for some people, it's better the physical body than starting something that has nothing to do with the physical. And then, being sure of one's goal or skillful, skillful means for ending suffering. How many, do you, how many of you guys set a goal to yourself? Well, if it's, if it, thank you, Yasko, but if it's uh, you know, a, the right goal or the wrong goal, um, that's a, I, th I think that's a step ahead, but do you have a goal? Especially when it, when it comes down to suffering. Do we have a goal? Do we establish something to say, look, I don't wanna go through this anymore. What can I do to avoid this from happening in the future? Whether it's something from the past or not, but when I say past is, you know, past reincarnations or not, um, what can I do to avoid this from happening? Now, don't fool yourself, as we mentioned in, in previous sessions, saying that it's going to change, right? Because perhaps we're going to do the same mistakes over and over again. But as long as we are not aware and we don't have a goal to change, it's not going to change. And suffering will come. And you're just going to be reliving over and over and over again. Okay? Moving on. In some cases, suffering is, is still the best therapy for human progress. While suffering, people transgress le less and reflect, reflect more. It's resulting in reestablishing balance. A change in behavior for the worst is common once afflictive factors decrease. A thirst for wrongdoing seems to assail immature individuals who will end up facing a future of pain-filled situations for their complicating the scant resources at their disposal. You have the headache, what happens? You wanna go ahead and cuddle and sleep, you don't wanna talk to anybody, right? You stop. When we get hurt, what do we need to do? The doctor tells us, just relax, don't do too much. That is the moment for us to reflect. So in pain itself, we find a, 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 a help uh, some kind of uh, a moment that we need to stop, decrease the activities, and think about the situation. And as Joanna DeAngeli mentions, most of the time, when the headache goes away, we go back to the old behaviors, old bad behaviors that will cause more headache in the future. We have a joke, uh, we have a joke amongst ourselves that, you know, most of us, when we look for the spirit, the center, when we look for religion, when we look for um, anything that will guide us into a more um, elevated life is when we're going through pain, the hardships of life. We went through that. Thank God we're still here. <laughs> 
But once that situation kind of fades away and everything seems to be normal again, what happens? We don't pray anymore. We don't um, do our assessments anymore. And we go back to the old behaviors. And we misuse the resources of life, as Joanna the Angel is saying. The cure of an infirmity requires the extinction of its causes. Anyone that has been bitten by an ardor or stunned by poisonous insects should first use a tourniquet to block the spread of the poison before combating it. If, fated, if faced with a person that has been hit by a poisonous arrow, ancient Hindu wisdom recommends pulling out the arrow first and then taking uh, further measures. Educating the mind and disciplining the will consists the first step for rooting out the causes of afflic affliction, instilling fresh responsibilities, which in turn generate new healthy outcomes to bring about the future well-being for which one is destined. What we do, what, what would the doctor do if we have to go through a uh, surgery and we have an infection? Will the doctor proceed with the surgery? What they will have to do first, stop the infection, treat the infection, take the arrow with the poison out, right? Stabilize and then act on. This comes, this is important for us in the sense that perhaps when we're going through the troubles of life that we cannot even think or not even pull the arrow out, as she's bringing um, Hindu wisdom here to help us, what do we need to do? We go to the center, we ask for the help, or we ask a family member, somebody that we trust that will help us until we get to that point that we're stabilized and then, okay, let's act on it right now. What is my plan? How will educate my, my thoughts? And how will educate my my habits as well, right? So step by step, nothing that is going to be, oh, I need to do this now. Sometimes we can go turk code, right, and just get things done, but not necessarily. Step by step. So we have to get to uh, the the bottom causes of it. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, she brings Jesus as an example. Jesus' recommendation above love about love is of indisputable effectiveness in that love is the generated generator of values responsible for human happiness love mellows individuals responsible and incites them to uplifting attitudes about life it leads them to think before making decisions considering which one are most compatible with the morals and longings of the heart never wanting for their neighbor what they would not want to experience for themselves. They can take on the commitments of prosperity without harm to themselves or others. Lucidity generated by love leads to indiscriminated, indiscriminate forgiveness for all people and consequently for oneself. She transitions now this part of the book, and there are many other discussions here, um, um, uh, paragraphs here before these paragraphs that we, that we um, shared, um, kind of give more explanations, but we can go through all of them. She transitions into this, this, the, the picture of Jesus, and uh, with that she brings this idea of what? Forgiveness. Which is one of the main reasons why we're suffering nowadays. And then we're going to talk a little bit more beyond uh, forgiveness. Let me bring in um, uh, something that I would like to share with you. Does anybody know what this family is and what this gentleman is and their relationship? We wish that he was, or they were, okay? Mr. Sidhu unfortunately took the life of the young man on the picture right there, one of Thomas. About a year ago, April 6th, if I'm not mistaken, in Canada, he was driving a semi-truck. He crossed a red light, actually um, shocked the, the bus that was taking all the kids for, to a hockey game. And that's actually the accent right there. That's what they have, uh, their connection right there. And, and we also stumble upon this, this, um, this unfortunate news, but also uplifting in a way, and we'll get there, 
recently since it's it's the one year mark of when it happened as well and the mr Sadooj recently was found guilty of several charges um, of driving the, the truck without uh, mainly drive the truck without uh, training um, and obviously running through the the red flashing red light and killing the team the hockey team that was actually going into um, the hockey game the 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 news that I came across was mainly a conversation with the father, Mr. Thomas, um, how he feels and how, you know, has been for this whole year, you know, looking at the whole situation and, and what are the feelings about? What about forgiveness in this whole thing, right? And it's not easy. It's not easy because he doesn't express that he is happy or he's fine. Obviously, it's a, you know, tragic thing. Um, but he does confess that there's nothing else that he can do but to forgive. Many other parents, they were upset about the situation. They actually really condemned Mr. Sidhu and say, you know, horrible things. And he apologized Mr. Sidhu for what he has done. Um, and he in no way um, did hide anything. He wasn't on the phone, interesting enough. He was not driving drunk. He was just careless. And he crossed the, 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 red, um, the red light. Unfortunately, killing the, killing the lives of 14 people. 15 people, and one being the, the, uh, one, the Thomas kids, um, Thomas kid. And this is the, uh, the moving non part of it, which is really interesting that, you know, many um, other teams that gather around, um, sending good vibrations to those who were lost and, and connected with the, um, the event. But the father clearly said, I have no other choice, because if I don't allow myself to move on, I will be connected with the situation. He actually went and talked to Mr. Sidhu and had conversation with Mr. Sidhu, but he never said what happened into, um, in, in their encounters together, right? Because he didn't want other parents to feel this or that way about him talking to uh, the driver, Mr. Sidhu, and he didn't want the judge to um, come with a decision that was based or biased uh, based on the, you know, his conversation. So he never disclosed what happened, but he clearly said, I forgive and I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for all the other parents, those involved with the, um, uh, with the accident. But there is a, 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 you know, this is just an illustration that I want to bring to everyone that we must move on. It's a drastic situation, but we must move on. And this is a way for us to get to the root of our problems because a lot of things that we're feeling right now is the burdens that we have brought, not only from this life, but from many lives. Those afflictions that we have, it's like, and why do I feel this way? And you don't have the answer. Number one, because we don't rescue, truly rescue the answer. Number two, because it's so far back, so far behind us, that it's really hard to treat it. Life is composed of incessant opportunity that lies ahead, that lie ahead, and never of the failures that occur in the past. Hence, like rotten wood cast into the, the river of forgetfulness, freeing oneself of a disagreeable event is an attitude of healthy wisdom. So use this beautiful um, analogy that she brings of those when you look in a river or something, you know, the, the, the wood down the bottom, just sitting there, especially cold water, you know, they, they're there, sitting there. Don't do the same thing. Just let it go. When one is freed from the mental garbage accumulated due to ignorance and futility, one's spiritual restoration begins. And a whole new activity presents itself, opening up space for health. Including in this group of uplifting endeavors is self-forgiveness. Considering their fragility, individual, um, individuals um, must grant themselves the opportunity to openly right their wrongs for the sake of their own conscience as well as for the sake of those whom they have harmed. I want to take two, a step here for us to analyze this in, in, in two different ways with two different examples. One is a comparison. Are you guys wearing the same thing that you were wearing this morning when you woke up? When you woke up? No. 
I know it's a strange question. If I invite you guys tomorrow, since it's getting warm tomorrow, for a pool party, right? And you get to the house and you see everybody playing at the pool. The pool's warm, you know, because I know the water thing. People think, oh, the water's still cold. The pool's warm, everyone. Just to learn, to learn everybody, right? And you get there and you see everybody's having fun. Are you going to jump in the pool the way you came from wherever you came? No. What do you have to do? You have to change. It's a trivial question, but it makes us think. And we'll, I'll make my point soon. Are you, how are you going to change? According to the situation, but how are you going to change? Are you going to go ahead and just, you know, and take your clothes off and put, you know, in the front of everybody? No, it's, it takes what? An effort for you to go to another, exclude yourself, change, right? Prepare yourself mentally for what's going to happen, right? Even though you're excited, you know the outcome or what you're trying to do, right? There is that acclimation. There is that moment that you have to accept that, yes, I'm going to the pool. I'm going to change myself, this and this and that. And then you come out and you join those individuals at the pool, right? The reason I'm going through this is because we have to acknowledge, give ourselves time, and we have to act on what? The acclimation of the environment. The acclimation of the environment. On um, chapter 11, um, item 3 of the Gospel According to Spiritism, um, I should have brought it over here. The kingdom of heaven is like the king. So and so and so. When the king absorbs the absorbs the 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 um, the faults or what the servant owed him and what did the king says okay after he begs right and say please please forgive me you know i don't have money to pay i can't sell my belongings i can't sell my family to pay you please forgive me and the master goes the king says okay all right he feels compelled I'll forgive you. You don't have to pay me back. After that encounter, the servant that was just relieved from his burden leaves and does what? Finds someone who owes him and does what? Pushes him against the wall and says, you have to pay my money, my hundred dinars. Where is my money? The guard seeing this whole situation does what? Goes and tells the king. The kings then orders him to go to the guards to go back and bring him back. And what does the king say? You fool. I just, you know, relieve you from all your, you know, what you have to pay me. And you get out there and you do the completely opposite. Now, was this servant in the pool of forgiveness? Was the servant in the um, in the ideal of forgiveness? No, not at all. So why can't we forgive? Or why can't we be forgiven? And ultimately, why do we suffer? Because we're not preparing ourselves to emerge this environment. Joanna de Angelis goes into, she doesn't say explicitly, but she does give us this guidance that is a matter of being in the mood, being in the environment, create this environment for us. Otherwise, nobody will create this environment for us because all that we're emanating, right, is what? Anger, right? Is, is, is um, really creating more, more trouble for our lives, more, more problems, relieving the pain, the pains, the types of pains that we have mentioned earlier today until we don't change our garments to get into that pool we're going to live just like the servant people sometimes they're going to be nice to us but we're going to go and do the, uh, something else completely opposite and that's why sometimes we don't we can't acknowledge self-forgiveness there are t you know when you say self-forgiveness for certain individuals like i forgive myself what kind of what are you saying there's no self-forgiveness right People don't even acknowledge this idea of self-forgiveness. The understanding that, yes, I made a mistake. I'm still growing. We're evolving spirits. And I will make a mistake again. Don't expect perfection from Leo because you're not going to get one.
Now, what you will get, and hopefully what everybody can help me is, let's try to do this differently. But if I don't accept that idea, guess what? You can say all you want. I will still continue to do the same. So it's an environmental thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really around us. And we have to create this shield that whatever we want, the plan, right? Whatever we want, we have to really try to grasp it. Where is it? Where is it that I can go ahead and connect with this idea? To finalize this chapter, when one forgives oneself, one also learns to excuse others, offering them the same opportunity in return. The well-being one experiences promotes the joy of offering it to the offended person, creating an aura of sympathy all around, which becomes just the right environment for release from suffering. The actual end of suffering, therefore, occurs when, with its causes eradicated, the consequences naturally disappear. Any questions? Because we're going to dive into a different, and it's going to be a little bit longer, and I want to make sure that there's no questions thus far, or any comments. Okay. Everybody has seen this question and this answer, but I brought it again. Why? Number one, because Joanna the Angel puts on the book as well. She actually, I'm, I didn't share all of them, but before the, the chapter starts, she actually brings a, a poem or um, a saying from someone, from an author. But at this time, she actually brought this amazing question that is, what is the purpose of the incarnation of spirits? What is the purpose of your, incarna or your, incarna your incarnation? What is it? Have you thought about it? What's your purpose? Relearn, okay? Evolve, all right? Now, we don't have to go into details because obviously we would have sit here for the whole night and I hope that you guys would have kept me here for the whole night for that purpose because that tells me or that would have tell ourselves that we were really thinking about this, right? So don't let this um, question, um, um, d don't allow yourself just to give yourself a abstract or subjective answer. That's what I'm trying to say. Really dig into it. He's evolving. You know, it's great. Yes, we know that we're evolving and we're going to see this here, but it has to be evolving what? How? How fast? What is stopping me from evol evolving as well? Because sometimes I may get caught up on my old ways. So she brings this to, um, um, for us to understand this, uh, the approaches to end of suffering, right? To end suffering. And the answer of this is very interesting. God imposes incarnations, incarnation for the purpose of leading spirits to perfection. For some, it is an expiation. For others, a mission. However, in order to reach this perfection, they must undergo all the vicissitudes of corporeal existence. Therein lies their expiation. Incarnation has a further objective, which is to place spirits in situations where they can do their share in the work of creation. To do this, uh, to this end, excuse me, on each world they clothe themselves with instrument, an instrument that is in harmony with the essential matter of that world so that they may use that instrument to carry out the orders of God. In this way, they contribute to the general work and progress at the same time. Three parts. Purpose of leading spirits to perfection. For some is an expiation, others are mission, right? Depending on, depends on how we see our situation. We talk about expiation, our trials in the last uh, session, right? We have to go through these difficulties of the physical body, the cold, this, el this illness, that situation, um, the heaviness of the physical body, right? The problems that we see that we have to take care of this, um, the little animals that we talked about, all these things. But we also are here to partake with God in creation. And if that is in not enough for you, <laughs> we need to sit down and study even more. But this is beautiful because it puts us ahead of the, 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 my problems, the physical body, right? And propels us into something that we most of the time don't know that we are doing, but we are doing automatically. We talk about helping the, the less evolved um, 
um, um, lives, types of life on earth, right? When you're helping that cat that you love so much, right? You're helping that cat develop the, 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 the sentiments, the feelings, right? That perhaps one day that will generate something else, that will become something else. Let's not go into that right now because that's a different topic. But we are doing this. We are helping one another. Our presence here with one another today gives us the assurance that we are going somewhere. We need this together, right? We're on the same march together. So we, it's more, it's beyond what we think. It's beyond just getting up in the morning, taking care of our businesses, go to work, come back home, and do whatever we have to do. And we're going to see a little, bit, a little bit more of this, and that's why I want to uh, uh, share this before, as well as Joanna puts this on the book. Approach to end of suffering, right? want to also share something with you. Another question that um, it is helpful to bring to light here, because we're going to talk about some things that may not be the the ultimate feeling for everybody, right? Question 886 of the Spirit's book. What is the true meaning of the word, the word charity as Jesus understood it? Benevolence. What else, Yasko? Okay. All right. So I, uh, let's just bring, thank you, because it is. Benevolence towards everyone, right? Indulgence towards the imperfection of others and forgiveness for offenses. I'll say it again, and I'm not trying to tire anybody. Definitely trying to keep everybody awake, but this is important. Benevolence towards everyone, indulgence towards the imperfection of others, and forgiveness of, for offenses. Another key element of this talk as well, of this discussion Love, to say I love you, is it enough? What is charity? Love in action. We got to put into action. We got to exercise. Do not give any excuses to yourself, first of all, and do not give any excuses to the world. It has to be actionable. It has to be into actions. It's amazing when you say it and when you hear it, but it has to get into action. If you don't cross that, that, that line, it's just going to stay in words, right? We're not going to exercise. So remember those two key elements that I just brought over here, as well as the other question that John the Angel put on the book. And let's go into this. Since suffering is caused by disorders in the spirit, disorders that disharmonize the flow of energy, allowing physical, mental, and moral infirmity to take root, the only way to effectively end it and we already explained this, is by getting to its cause. This, is, this will stop the disturbing wave in a lucid mind. The result will be tranquility, which will produce health, which will radiate throughout the body, generating balance. Thus, this chain reaction will be the effectual remedy to suffering. Until there is a real healthy conscience, the individual will go from one form uh, of suffering um, to another. And then she brings the ancient Buddhist wisdom again, establishing that establish a system of um, meditation through which health takes hold and suffering disappears. Jesus, on the other hand, the bearer of complete balance, considered love as the sole cause for the optimal fulfillment of the individual. The subversion or ab absence of love for God, one's neighbor, or oneself produces dissatisfaction, maladjustment, and imbalanced energies. Hence, this subversion of absence is the causal factor of sickness and suffering. I know it's a lot, and we're reading a lot, but we have to bring, the, to, to bring this foundation. Okay, So, key elements here. We, again, visit the fact that the, if we don't get to the cause, we're not going to get anywhere. It's going to be that Advil that we take, and then tomorrow we have the headache again, right? This healthy conscience will start stabilizing ourselves that we can go to the operating room, right? Creating this healthy. Until we don't do that, 
until we don't have this love now that she's bringing here. And it's interesting that she talks about the system of the me system of meditation. What do we say? What do we do here at the, the SSB? Paula have brought meditation. I talk on meditation alone. What do we do here at SSB? What does Joanna De Angelis tells us to do? Meditate. Why do we meditate? It's not just to sit there and feel zen. No, it's really to get in, right? Analyze what, what's happening. Why do you feel this way? And we can do this with prayer too. Or mantra. If we want to repeat your, and you get to that moment, perhaps in, not exactly in that moment, but later on you start getting, ah, oh, this is what happened. This is where I missed the boat, right? And then bringing Jesus to the enlightenment, to the ultimate example of love. As we just mentioned, benevolence towards everyone, indulgence towards the imperfection of others, and forgiveness of offenses. Why? Let's see what Joanna, Joanna has, <laughs> brings to us. Introspection through a profound analysis of the available resources helps individuals find the means to put an end of suffering or to suffering. <coughs> Look at this. Look at this. Coming from a different logical perspective, they progress towards inner harmony, sending forth a steady stream of health preserving energy that radiates in all directions and in and enter in interplay, excuse me, with the divine vibration, life's essential co um, cause. These are individuals that are looking for this love. They are getting in this uh, environment of love again. The following is an example of this. First, people must see all individuals as if they were the manifestation of their own parents who gave them physical life, especially the mother due to the sacrifices she willingly endured during pregnancy, childbirth, and the life-preserving nourishment born in her entrails. How can you see someone <laughs> who just did something wrong towards you or towards your family as your own son? Parents, help me out. <laughs> it's hard. But this is what Joanna De Angelis is saying. That's why I brought those that, you know, how Jesus perceived love and wants to bring love to us because it's hard to put ourselves in this situation. I never done it. I, the, the, the closest I ever done it, and I'm not saying in an egotistic way or to put myself up there, was to analyze that as I am a son of somebody, right? I am a brother of somebody. I'm a father also. I tend to see people that way. There's somebody who loves that individual. But I never thought about putting myself as directly as the mother of that individual who has done something wrong. And I'm excluding the idea of being a father. I am a father. I know how I feel about being you know, a father figure, right? But a mother, that's really hard. So she's taking the bar all the way up there and saying, change your ways. Change your ways. May May in the book, um, Our Father, she exemplifies this so well, right? To being this caring and kind individual towards one another and towards nature, as we're going to see here as well. This right here is key, guys. And if we can do this a little tiny bit, <laughs> a little tiny bit, uh, it will help us quite a bit, okay? And especially when you see age, right, or, or you have an age difference, you know, that someone is a little bit older than you are, how can you be, well, there is a way, right? It's, it's harder, but it is a way. Even if she did not adequately fulfill her freely assumed and accept obligations, the face of having uh, enable life to manifest gives her credit as an example to be considered. So all problems aside that we perhaps may have with our parents, sometimes we have to acknowledge that as well. Sometimes mothers are they're not the best examples. They gave us life. Some people, they're completely against it. But we have to understand this idea of giving life. This is what Joanna Duan is, is trying to bring to us. As I have myself some issues with Dona Flavio, someone of you guys know, you know, she <laughs> really wanted to make sure that I, you know, did the right things, <laughs> you know, calling my attention, just like this little mother, this mother here with this little boy. The image of the mother may account for many conflicts. You hear that full name, 
Leonardo. Oh gosh, <laughs> run because <laughs> that's the only thing you can do. For, you know, fast better than her. You know, run faster. You know, we used to joke about this, and I joke sometimes. I tell the stories to my kids as well, but um, it, it's it sometimes it really shakes us, right? The 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 father figure, the mother, the grandparents. Sometimes they're even worse. It's like, oh gosh, you know, I my grandpa, my grandfather, you know, can you know, we would never say this next to him or whatnot. And then it says, but it also creates healthy stimuli. Her sacrifices and dedication, her endless hours of watchfulness, and her self-denial for for her uh, for her offspring, the songs that she sang to her newborns and all the promises that eventually came true all deserve to be taken into account reflected on and projected to all sentiment sentient beings if this is not a good example for you let's study more <laughs> i don't want to condemn you i don't want to say anything but this is an amazing way for us to move on for us to change our ways when it comes down to suffering and, and now we're we're really projecting this feeling of life, of giving life, right, towards someone in a different level, so that whatever was done towards us can be diminished, right? And I want to just um, this is since this I I believe this is an important part. I didn't put over here, but bear with me. No, was something meant to have not. I want to share another another part that she mentions. We'll find it. Starting. Okay. Okay. This is how it's going to change. When faced with aggression or subjective, or subject to difficulties from angry, cynical, mean, or abusive individuals all unwell in any case, one should look at them as if they were one's mother during a time of weakness or fatigue, feeling unloved and alone. We don't hear him often crying, but if Raphael is crying when he's here with us, why is he crying? Something's wrong. He's either hungry, he's either upset because he needs to be changed, right? Not saying in that the, the you know that and like I said we don't hear him do it because he's a great child and I'm pretty sure you know Kirsten and, and and Daniel takes care of him well, but when a child is crying, there's something wrong. And the mother goes in there, utilizes all the resources that she has, puts aside everything or does a million things, right, while taking care of that child. Most of the time, the father does not know how to do that, but the mother does. So let's think about that. Instead of reacting with aggression, anger, or vind vindictive indifference, one should use kind, kindly patience, offer a chance for reflection, a sincere apology without resentment or acrimony. This behavior releases them from bitterness, hatred, and rancor responsible for illnesses that infiltrate easily but are difficult to eradicate, okay? Not me saying, Joanna the Angelus. <laughs> Joanna the Angelus. So uh, let's share this idea. Not necessarily like be the mother, but let's share this idea with one another. And here is what Joanna the Angelus, how Joanna the Angelus extends this idea. In an extension of such affection, consideration for mother's nature is of fundamental importance for ecological balance and consequently for all those who contribute to its harmony. Thus seeing the positive, pleasant maternal aspect in all living beings provides strength for the preservation or restoration of health, release from, release from suffering and well-being, all which are essential conditions for happiness. She takes this idea of being a mother, right, and seeing the good things, mother nature. How many times do we hurt mother nature and mother nature rebels, but guess what? After the storm comes what? The sun bright weather, right? And it gives us the opportunity to redo, to rebalance ourselves, and to do what? To give back. 
to give back. So let's extend this a little bit more. <clears throat> in its acquisition of, of wisdom to be able to, re to reach into people's latent goodness, seeking to, to tune into that frequency of life rather than being bound only to their outward manifestation, their defensive aggressive, aggressive reactions, which carry more morbid, morbific, excuse me, the letters are here, very tiny, maybe I should read from there, morbific vibrations that unleash many of the ills responsible for suffering. From the experience of identifying the goodness in people, in general, comes the extraordinary achievement of discovering God's presence everywhere. So, if I see someone doing something good, right, with the motherly eye, what would the mother do? Or say, great job. Do it again, emphasizing the positive. Even if it is something not so well. Okay, you try, but let's try to do this way, right? And then we start doing that with one another more and more and more. What's going to happen tomorrow? More positive things will happen. More po positive things will be evaluated. More po positive things will be exalted, thus leaving us, putting us in a better position. Preserve every w presence, ev presence everywhere it all cre in all creatures, excuse me, gr God's presence everywhere. In all creatures, establish emotional bonds for um, conscious interaction, since unconsciously individuals, unconsciously, excuse me, individuals are in this, excuse me, I gotta read from here, <laughs> inescapably interdependent, enabling the, enabling the automatic phenomenon of interaction um, to become lucid is a valid endeavor that foster human progress in telling the development of more eloquent and significant skills. So seeing the good in life, seeing the good in other people in every situation, even when there is something wrong happening, because we can use that situation as a starting point and as an ending point as well, that that shouldn't happen anymore. So let's take that example and move on. Right, so I think this is a, an, an ultimate exercise that we have to do, an extension of every everything that we have to think that we can think. Right, especially guys, you know, the men thinking as a, a mother and accepting others as their kids. Um, but it's definitely a way for us to end suffering. Remember, our ultimate goal is to end suffering. Pain and suffering are generally more primitive stage of the development process, which though which through afflictive sensations and emotions propel individuals towards higher planes where the stimuli are different and much more inviting since god's presence lies in everything and everywhere it is necessary to discover excuse me in every in everyone it is necessary to discover in them the goodness that expresses their divine essence and origin anything that is negative is primitive if I act in a, in a disagreeable manner, right, to society, most likely that, that um, action um, is primitive. It comes from my primitive, primitive being inside of me or my old ways that I haven't been able to get rid of yet, right? So we have to watch for that. And we have to analyze that it's still good inside of us, that I st have some good inside of me as well the natural laws, right? And we will talk about something really interesting about natural laws in a second. Likewise, when any important quality is identified, especially the goodness in people, animals, and in the lofty purposes of, the, of plain life, one should plan to repay that sentiment from the starting point of intention and as a natural means of repayment. One should let the desire to give back decrease, to give back increase the goodness that is already more developed in one's inner world. So we went from seeing someone as we started. We start with the Jesus example, uh, inviting us to see everyone as a mother, right? Recognizing the good, the goodness inside of us. We transition into this idea of mother nature nature in general, 
right? The extension of this idea of mother giving. Now we're doing what? Repaying it back. How do we repay back? Right? How, uh, what is the, the true extension of, or the, the ultimate example of being grateful? Ideas? Uh huh. Right? In other words, exercise it. Don't just say, oh, thank you, or I'm grateful for this. Not necessarily if you were to give me a gift today, whatever that is, um, whether it's something material or not, I'm going to go ahead and be able to repay that gift to that individual. Can we repay our mothers for our presence here? No. Can we ever show her the ultimate you know, idea of being grateful directly to her? No. But how do we show that we are grateful? By being a good citizen. Right? By being a good citizen. How do we, do we um, um, exalt the name of God on earth? By being a good citizen. Being someone respectful, being someone who helps. To the best of our abilities, yes. I'm not saying that we're going to be Jesus tomorrow <laughs> or tonight after this talk. No, it's to do our best. If we want to do anything or learn a little bit more, it's right here, right? When um, Kardec brings to us what is to be um, a, 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 a good person towards the, I forget the, ch the, the chapter now, a good person with the help of spiritism, Evaluate our thoughts, what we have done, how can we do this better, how can we help our neighbors better, so on and so forth. Okay? Goodness is a small effort that comes from the duty to joyfully repay all the gifts that people enjoy without realizing it or putting forth any effort automatically like the sun, the moon, and the stars, the sky, air, landscape, water, planes, and animals, in which humans inadvertently have been consuming, polluting, unconsciously, un, un, excuse me, unconscionably, yes, and killing mercilessly. Choosing to ace, excuse me, choosing to act or not act with goodness is a decision of the mind, and producing the good is of the heart. Remember this right here. Sorry about the typo there. I'm copying the information, you know, what's appropriate for us to um, bring here, and sometimes we, this happens. Uh, I do apologize. Choosing to act or not to act with goodness is a decision of the mind, and producing, producing the good is of the heart. So we can reason all we want, but ultimately when we reason and we put our heart, what happens? The product. Because I say, I want to do it, now I'm going to really... Not only say thanks, but I'm going to do something accordingly that will really bring substance to what I just said. Expanding the, the imminent sentiment that harmonizes with the soul of life pulsating in everywhere, the practice of love fosters the end of suffering, should it exist. Love is the most powerful antidote for any degenerative phenomena that take the form of pain, ingratitude, aggression, imbalance, crime, or disgrace. It has ingredients that dilute evil in favor the emergence of hidden good. Okay? And again, we talk about the absence, right? If it's not there, that's when we get all the pain and all the difficulties that we see. In the same way that crime is disguised and the lower sentiments are veiled behind various masks, there are a number of positive ways in which people reflect the love that they have not yet realized. As love grows, it neutralizes suffering, and its presence contributes to ending the degenerative causes of suffering. When love reaches a high degree in just one person, and allows rage and hatred, along with their countless victims, as well as their promoters. 
love is synonymous to, with moral health, and those who possess it eliminate the poisonous causes that propagate producing suffering. I want to get to a point real quick here. This is just a foundation to what is going to happen. Love is subtle, sensitive, patient, and constant. It is never annoying or imposing. However, choose, chose who experience it never forget. <clears throat> Excuse those um, who is experienced it never for, those who experiences well never forget it. Even if it flows, it momentarily interrupted. It always resumes. At the root of every noble action is the sap of love, producing and excuse me, producing it and sustaining life. Now, what happens with all of this that we just said? I know it's repetitive in a way that we're talking about love and it is just words for right now because we're all going to put in practice that you do all this and you still are in pain. Bring a, 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 a condition that perhaps we have faced with um, our brothers and sisters, right? An illness that will bring us to the loss of a, the physical body. That perhaps until now we don't have yes a uh, uh, yet a cure, right? An ending illness. What do we do? She also talks about it. However, when physical pain persists as a result of organic disorders, resignation and the courage of love dampens its effect, making them bearable and producing heroes of suffering, whose agony of, of whatever kind makes them noble motto, excuse me, that gives strength and dignity to others, thus embellishing moral and human life on earth. Under the power of love, new positive karmic dynamics are set in motion, interrupting those of a pernicious, pernicious nature. For good negates evil and its consequences, free in transgressions of the law, of the laws once they begin to abide by them and right their wrongs. It's a process. We have to start somewhere. If we are facing this, we do what she's doing here, but we have to think in the future. What kind of life do I want to create for the future? Because yes, we are being bombarded with ideas, with sentiments, with um, the, the, um, the, the, the problems that we see in everyday, in everyday life, um, whether it's here in the US or perhaps another nation, right? We're being affected. The economic issues, the problems that this other um, um, country is facing, we're being bombarded with all of this, the way we feel, the way we respond to it, but what about our environment? It's not that I'm saying forget what's going on out there, but what about the environment that I'm creating around myself and around others as well? Especially when I'm also facing the chronic headaches that sometimes we may have. And the headache could be countless, right, that we have. And this guy is also touching, you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 the back, the, you know, the, the another point that sometimes most of the time you know suffers for some of us as well that's why i like that picture um in a sense to bring to us um what we're trying to what joanna the angel is trying to picture okay let us finalize this with the following because it, it's another concept and we will do a recapitulation because it's quite a bit love is what leads to fraternal piety and compassion Introducing individuals to solidarity and even sacrifice. Christ's love for all of all is a constant stimulus for people to have compassion on one another, upholding one another in suffering and difficulties, never worsening one's another's needs or afflicting one another through the aggressive instincts that could still prevail in their animal nature. Compassion. That's the final word for this chapter. Seeing ourselves as a mother, getting the best out of everybody, right? 
connecting with nature in general that gives us so much, right? Repaying it back, this idea of love in action, and then an ultimate topic that she brings to us in this chapter is to have compassion. Not making anybody else's life worse or the situation worse. Let's make it easier, right? Let's instill love. Let's instill uh, work, determination, courage, right? But let's not make it worse. Compassion is vitally important in human behavior. It leads to the realization of the fragility of bod bodily existence and all the enticements that disguises it. Whereas illusion is responsible for ceaseless suffering, compassion exposes it. Since individuals render earthly life and fantasy with their chimera chimeras and dreams, reality undoes the childish image, image, causing suffering for all those who, in their immaturity, put too much crust, trust in the um, transient of forms and physical appearance, promises of eternal love and fidelity, joy without sorrow, and 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 soon without twilight, and noon, excuse me, without twilight at the end of the journey. I want to just stop here, just give an example of this. A couple of years ago, I took a trip uh, back home to Brazil, and I actually um, went um, to my father's home state, and we walked. And we walked and we walked. <laughs> but it was a walk for me. Because usually when I walk, I walk fast. But because we don't do that, I, I don't have the chance to see my father perhaps every year. I usually go um, whenever I can or every two years. I didn't get to see him kind of slowing down, <laughs> right? The deterioration of the body. Little pain in the knee that he has and the ankle as well. To me, I didn't take that in consideration and let's just go for a walk. And we're walking and walking. And then I noticed, I'm like, why are we walking so slow? And I'm like, can we go a little bit faster? And it was like, ah, oh, perhaps I can. He can, right? The deterioration of the body reminds of this compassion. The difference that we have with one another reminds of this compassion that we have with one another. It just because I'm tall, Yes, I can reach up here, but not everybody. Not everybody have the same skills. Not everybody have the same capabilities to reason things. And then we bring compassion to the situation as well. And this is after Joanna de Angelis talking about being the mother figure. She's still adding this element of compassion. Of saying, wait, wait a minute. Slow down. <laughs> You're not alone, right? So I think this is another example. Um, and, and I bring this personal example because I felt bad afterwards. I was like, wait a minute, wow, man, I shouldn't have, you know, I shouldn't be walking this way. And I remember, you know, us taking these, these long trips or doing whatever. Um, he was pretty active. Now he's slowing down with the age and everything. It's okay. We're going to go through this as well. It made me think also how I want my kids to treat me when I get to that age. They still cannot catch me, but and perhaps one day they will when I'm running. But anyways, it's just something for us to think about it. That element of the physical body is definitely an example for us to think about compassion. A couple more slides and we will go to our questions. Awareness of reality results from observing daily events. The transience of the so-called objective world and a peace, peaceful, lucid anal analysis about what is true in relation to what is apparent, what is essential in relation to what is secondary, and so on. Self-compassion, self-love, enables one to have a realistic, non-aggressive vision of the purpose of earthly ex existence, stimulating one's compassion for one's neighbor, love for others, understanding their struggle and offering them a hand in order to uphold them or help them up so they may continue on their journey. Compassion, the last part. And I will skip this over here, um, but what, the, the, what Joanna De Angelis through this last um, um, part of the chapter, she reminds of us again of the illusory ideals that we have in our lives. 
the illusion that we create in our lives, expectations that will bring us suffering as well. And it's okay to project ourselves this or that way, but not in an illusionary way that it's not going to happen. It has to be concrete so we don't suffer, okay? To finalize, enlightenment results from the inner search for the self, a wise choice in relation to the ego that prevails in the mapping of the more immediate human aspirations to those agents of vital disruptions and overwhelming failures in the struggle, which the brief corporeal existence is. True enlightenment advances individuals who surpasses the limit limiting contingencies of the carnal phase and now all causes of suffering effectively putting an end to them they no longer need pain to reach their goals because love is their sole reason for living in tune with the divine thought that attracts them more and more vigorously toward the ultimate goal sorry again about the typos there i'll be more careful next time in the book, Action and Reaction, Andrea Louise also emphasizes on this idea that pain and love, these two elements of life, is what propels us into the future, into a better person. And unfortunately, we are still choosing pain. And that's what Joanna de Angelis wants to us to get out of it, right? We only go to the center when we're not doing well. We only go to the doctor when we're not doing well. When they get to the point that we, the, uh, the Advil of life is not serving anymore. It's not working. So we need to ch change our ways. We need to allow ourselves to say, okay, the painkiller helped me yesterday, but really, why was I feeling that pain? As we, I don't know what that is, sorry. It wasn't me. It's, I'm just talking on the microphone. <laughs> um, but we need to change. Okay, this is what Joanna De Angelis is inviting us. I would like to, instead of doing a little bit proactive homework, I'm going to be sending some, um, when I say proactive, you know, asking you questions about, you know, what this is, what that may, or how you feel about perhaps the next topic. We will, but I think I'm going to take some of the key elements that we study here, and I'm going to send it to you guys through uh, WhatsApp, if you were in the group, uh, reminding as well, watch the uh, the video. We're not streaming live tonight, uh, but we then it will make it available to us soon. But I would like to you guys to buy the book, read the book, analyze these uh, these options. If you want me to remind you, please connect with me, <laughs> ask me because as you ask me, as you remind me, guess what? It's helped me as well. So it's a great discussion. I wish we had more time. It's a little over an hour. And I would like to open for a couple questions so we can move on to the next part. Question, comments? Uh, it's so important, all these uh, topics, so many things to learn. But one thing that stick to my mind was that this process of and suffering and needs to develop our skill. We have to be skillful for that. That means I'm not born knowing how to end up my suffering. On the contrary, I'm born to create suffering. That is easy for me because of my past habits, my past way to uh, make things, you know, the way I want. But to end suffering, nobody teach you. Only life. And to say that I need to be skillful, I need to have skill I'm to, in order to end, oh my God, that means we have to do every day, every, you know, moment, this kind of um, development, study, and learning, you know, first is what is my goal, actually, just to end my, my headache, 
That's what we all do. My goal is just to finish with my headache. Immediate satisfaction, immediate uh, remedy. But that doesn't help in, uh, to end the real suffering. It ends the pain, but not the suffering, the end. So I think this is important. And also, I think when she says about compassion, love, in this time, modern time, that seems we have to copy what the mass are doing, you know, mothers, parents are doing this way to put their kids in college. My kid has also to go to college. So, you know, and suddenly you have a kid that has a mental problem. And then you feel left over because now I cannot enter in this group to, to, of mothers and parents to have my kid in the college. You have to reassess what are the real importance in life in this incarnation when you have a, a kid with Down syndrome or other illness. It's still a beautiful human being that makes you assess differently what are the goals. Thank you, Yasko. I'm not going to comment too much because it is true. It's something that we have to um, look within our lives. Um, the, the developing skills in, in the same way we were not born, as you said, to do the right things, um, we are also born to try and develop these skills, right? Develop the, uh, the new conditions, the, um, the new beginnings of life. And, and one thing I know for sure, just our presence here, by our, um, the way we live, the way we try, already tells us that we want this change. We want this change. And that is in itself a huge leap that perhaps we don't see everywhere in the world. Hopefully we'll be able to see this more and more. Um, but, you know, we can um, exalt in the good, as Joanna de Angelis did, you know, the, the different congregations, the different um, acts in the world, um, our laws, you know, a lot of things is propelling us to uh, developing these skills. So I de definitely agree um, that we have to do that. Yes. Anyone else? Joanna. Just a, a brief comment uh, to add uh, th the way that I see all of your, this beautiful book and you trying to guide us is like the idea that we always gonna suffer, but we have, we can, it is allowed to, to minerate the, the, the pain, like uh, calling our, our attention that there are many things you can do to live your life the best you can and live well among people, not in war, like not in, you know, teasing and thinking bad about people, people not thinking bad about you. And, you know, some, sometimes, as you said, because inside you are not okay. So you go and have this idea of looking into people like, you know, that person hates me, this person doesn't like me, this this is a situation that is against me, and it's not, but you are in that, in internally, you are not okay. So when you asked uh, what to do, uh, how can I change all that? Okay, is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it hard? Yes, it is, but it's possible. You know, it's not impossible. Like you're born like this, you're gonna die like this. <laughs> no, no, you, th there are ways, you know, of, uh, I think that's what the whole process really is, you know, so I think that's very, hopeful, very um, soothing for us. It is. And, and uh, I, I, Joanna De Angelis, in, 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 in any uh, part of this book, um, she brings to us the, the illusion, again, that it's easy. It's going to be easy. It will not be easy. Uh, we have to work. She brings the the example of you know using the fiber of our sentiments, using uh, you know our rational as our reason, you know in many cases for us to release ourselves from suffering. The ultimate idea is plenitude, is happiness, and it's there. 
she just mentioned that one day we're not going to need pain anymore to be happy. It's, it's kind of hard to understand, right? Pain to find happiness, to get to happiness. It's, it, one doesn't go with the other, but this is how we're living. Because once we feel the pain, most of the time, hopefully, <laughs> you know, we try to do something better. We change the team. The team. We're going to go from that, um, um, from, from seeking the negative to, the, to get to the positive, to looking for the positive, to get to the positive, to even some, to a better product that we are. Limiting ourselves. Thinking twice before we act. Um, asking for the right things, <laughs> desiring the right things. So I think this is a transformation. Paula, and then we're going to um, close it up. I'm just uh, picking up on Yaska's question of where are our skills, because we're not naturally raised with them. Joanna, looking at ancient Buddhist wisdom, said that meditation is a process through which health takes hold and suffering disappears. Meditation really is a skill that needs to be learned. We have a general idea, so the easiest way to have it become a practice is if one can take some repeated instruction. The PBS um, movie I showed a while back, Mindfulness Goes Mainstream, is one good resource because on the second DVD are many different examples of meditation skills that one can watch and practice at home. Or whenever life presents the opportunity, if you can take an extended class, say six to eight weeks, that's another great way to get it. Thank you for reminding I guess, uh, us again of this um, beautiful um, um, teaching that she brings to us, that Joanna, Joanna the Angeli brings to us. It was a, a how am I going to say this? Um, the little that I got um, when Joanna the Angeli introduces the idea of meditating, literally stopping and meditating into spiritism because there wasn't before. It was a commotion among the spiritists. There was this thing of meditation. Yes. Everything started when, huh? Right. Everything started with a situation that Uncle Nilsson had and Duvaldo also had that we have the meditation CDs and, you know, and many of you are aware of it translated into English, some of them. And we, we, we had to go through this change of taking what the, 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 the Hindu wisdom has, she says in many times, has brought to us connecting with you know, Christianity and in, in, in really allowing ourselves into this love, right? And then rationalize, rationalize the good. <laughs> and it's interesting that, yes, I mean, we don't have the skills, but there are ancient you know, traditions and teachings that already have the skills, develop the skills. We just have to apply to ourselves. We don't have to pay somebody for it. We just have to apply to ourselves. Beautiful DVD that you mentioned, right? It's, it's public. It, anybody can go and access it online. And if you want to learn more, a, a little bit more, it's there. The same thing with any other teaching, anything that we like to develop. I think that um, by far, this is um, steps, uh, new steps that we have to take because what we have seen in the past is not that we knew the way Extrana the Angelis explained, but these new um, 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 examples that she brings and this, these challenges that she brings to us to see life as the one who gives life is something new. So I hope that all of you can take this home, practice, meditate <laughs> on it, right, and put it into practice. So we will pass to the second part. We will not have the passes tonight. We will um, do a short visualization, short prayer, and then we will pass to... Uh